Good evening. Welcome to the Singapore Cancer Society World Health Day Webinar 2021. My name is Ivy Lim. I'm the host for tonight. Thank you for tuning in uh, from Zoom and also Facebook for today's World Health Day Webinar 2021. Uh, before we start, remember to like and subscribe to our social account on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date and connect with us. We would like to invite you at home to help us spread the awareness of health, sharing the Facebook stream and start watch party on Facebook. You could do this by creating a FB post and click on the watch party icon that looks like a movie popcorn. Search for the SCS World Health Day webinar and post it on your own Facebook news feed. If you have any questions, remember to type your question in the Q&A section. We will try our very best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of uh, when our panelists have finished their presentation. We could, you can start trying that by pre uh, pressing plus one if you are a returned uh, participant to our event. It would be good to see some old friends, you know, connecting with us again. This webinar is supported by the National University Cancer Institute of Singapore, NCIS, Yuyan Sang, and Farrah Park Hospital. And this evening, we are very lucky and very honoured that we have three speakers with us. Uh, from my far right, uh, let me introduce Dr. Tan Hon Lin. She is the consultant from the National University Cancer Institute of Singapore from the Department of Hematology Oncology. And uh, next to her, between us, is Mr. Eric Tan. Uh, he is from Yu Yan Sang, a traditional Chinese medicine trainer specialist. And on my left, Ms. Rachel Ong. She's the senior dietitian from the Farrah Park Hospital. Do we have any returned uh, participants or, or viewers today? Thank you. Um, the first topic that comes up tonight, uh, we're talking about liver cancer. For all the years uh, since 20, 2008 that I have volunteered for Singapore Cancer Society, I don't remember actually we have a special public awareness program that target on liver cancer. So this is a very unique and very good topic uh, for tonight. So tonight we have Dr. Tan who is going to share with us uh, liver cancer symptoms and treatment options. Over to you Dr. Tan, thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you for having me. We'll be talking about liver cancer today. So what is liver cancer? Primary liver cancer is cancer that starts in the cells of the liver. There are a few types of primary liver cancer, with the most common being hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC for short. This cancer arises from liver cells, also known as hepatocytes. There's also cholangiocarcinoma, which arises from the bile ducts. Hepatoblastoma is a rare childhood liver cancer. And angiosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma are rare cancers that arise from blood vessels. It is a lot more common to see cancers arising from other organs, for example, colon cancer, breast cancer or lung cancer spreading to the liver. And in that situation, that's called metastatic cancer. For the purpose and focus of tonight's talk, we'll be talking about hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's not that uncommon. Worldwide, liver cancer is the sixth most common cancer. And in Singapore, among men, it is the fourth most common cancer after colorectal, lung, and prostate cancer. It is less common among Singaporean women. This is a list of uh, risk factors for liver cancer, and we will be going through the more common ones in the following slides. Liver cirrhosis is a condition where the liver develops hardening and shrinkage over a period of time of injury or insults from chronic conditions or chemicals such as hepatitis B or C virus infections or chronic alcoholism. As the liver gets injured, what it does is it tries to repair itself and in that process, scar tissue forms. And over time, as more scar tissue forms, the liver hardens and the liver function deteriorates. This process also exposes the liver cells to mutations and increasing the risk of cancer formation. Now, across the world, hepatitis B and C chronic infections are the most common risk factor for developing liver cancer. Hepatitis B is endemic in many parts of the world, especially Asia. And many people um, with hepatitis B infection actually do not have symptoms. 90% of the people who get hepatitis infection recover fully without any long-term 
health effects, but 10% will have long-term or on chronic ongoing hepatitis B infection that predisposes them to developing liver cirrhosis and then liver cancer. This is actually preventable with the hepatitis B vaccine. Now, moving on to hepatitis C, it is also common in several parts of the world, but more so in the West than in the East. Again, patients with hepatitis C infection tend not to have symptoms in, if they are a carrier in the early stages of the illness. Hepatitis B and C, um, are, they are transmitted via blood, via um, the use of contaminated needles, for example, in IV drug usage, um, unprotected sex or childbirth. Unlike hepatitis B, there is no vaccine to prevent hep C infection. The only way to prevent infection is to avoid exposure and the risk factors as discussed earlier. Alcoholic liver disease in its early stages, again, often doesn't have symptoms. Over many years of drinking alcohol, fat builds up in the liver and that can lead to inflammation or alcoholic hepatitis and that increases the risk of liver cirrhosis. The symptoms of alcoholic liver cirrhosis typically show up only later on when the liver is no longer able to compensate for its dysfunction. And then there's this entity of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or fatty liver where fat builds up unrelated to the intake of alcohol. NASH is closely related to obesity and diabetes. Many patients with this condition actually do not have specific symptoms and the condition remains undiagnosed until later stages when the liver is already scarred. Now, perhaps understanding the function of the liver will help us understand symptoms of liver disease a little better. So the liver is very important to us. It helps us metabolize or um, break down nutrients that we absorb from the gut. It produces proteins, including many of our clotting factors. Um, it secretes bile to help us digest our food, particularly fat. It helps us break down alcohol, drugs, and other toxins in our body which then pass out via urine or stool. It also functions as a storage organ for energy and nutrients. That said, actually many patients with liver cancer do not have specific symptoms, particularly in the early stages. When symptoms appear, they may include some of these, such as poor appetite, weight loss, general tiredness, tummy swelling, or jaundice. These are quite non-specific symptoms, and in fact, a lot of them are associated with other conditions besides liver cancer. And it doesn't mean that if you have these symptoms, you necessarily have liver cancer. That said, should you experience any of these problems, do visit your doctor to diagnose the underlying problem and treat it early. For treatment of liver cancer, it really depends on three things. The extent of the cancer, the health of the underlying liver, and the general condition of the patient. And we consider the options of surgery, liver-directed therapy, or systemic therapy, on top of supportive care for all our patients. We'll talk a little bit in detail about each of these categories. Now, the best way to cure a patient um, of liver cancer would be to remove the tumour altogether by surgery or via a liver transplant. Only people with good liver function who are healthy and well enough to undergo a surgery with limited tumour not invading into the blood vessels may be suitable to undergo resection of the liver or removal of parts of the liver. Many patients with liver, cirrhosis, uh, with liver cancer have underlying cirrhosis and a poorer liver function, which may not allow them to undergo even removing a small part of the liver. A transplant may be um, suitable for a small group of patients where the diseased liver is removed altogether and replaced with a healthy donor liver. This is a major surgery and selection of our patients needs to be done very carefully. For localised tumours that are not suitable for surgery, there is a 
several options of local or liver-directed therapy that we can consider. Ablation involves inserting a needle or a probe into the tumour to destroy the cancer cells around it. Radiofrequency ablation refers to using high-energy waves to kill cancer cells. Injection of alcohol into the tumour also can directly damage cancer cells. And cryoablation refers to using extreme cold to destroy the cancer cells. There are some side effects of um, ablation which can include discomfort, bleeding, infections, abnormal liver tests, or a fever. Serious complications are uncommon but can happen. Another procedure that can be done is um, transarterial embolization. Embolization refers to injecting substances into the blood vessel to block off or reduce blood flow. So the liver is unique in that it is supplied by two different um, blood vessels. Most of the normal liver receives its blood supply from the portal vein, whereas liver cancers tend to derive their supply from the hepatic artery. So by blocking off branches of the hepatic artery that feed the tumour, we can kill off cancer cells there, while at the same time leaving the rest of the normal liver largely unharmed as they get their supply from the other blood vessel. Selective internal radiation therapy or radioembolization makes use of tiny little microbeads that have um, radioisotopes on them um, that emit radiation. And this allows a high concentration of radiation to be delivered to the liver direct to the liver tumors directly while sparing the rest of the liver and other organs. And then there's also radiation therapy that uses high energy level external beams to try to destroy cancer cells. In the situation where cancers are more advanced, there are medications or systemic therapy that we give to try to control the cancer and to prolong life. In recent years, more and more drugs have been developed to try and treat cancers and the current mainstay of systemic therapy for liver cancer includes targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Traditional chemotherapy does not typically work well for liver cancer. Many of the targeted drugs that we use to treat liver cancer are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which come in a tablet form. There are, com there are some common side effects that we may see with these medications, including tiredness, poor appetite, Hand foot syndrome, which is actually rashes, redness, swelling and blistering over the hands and the feet, high blood pressure, diarrhea and hypothyroidism. Less common but serious side effects include possible bleeding, development of blood clots and perforation of the gut. Now, immunotherapy has been largely talked about in the treatment of liver cancer and other cancers in recent years. This immunotherapy activates our immune system to fight cancer and our immune system doesn't fight cancer in some situations as the cancer cells produce proteins that blind or switch off the immune cells towards attacking them. Immunotherapy acts on this and releases the bricks of the immune system to allow these cancer cells to be first recognized and then targeted by our immune system. That said, this also means that normal cells in our body may be affected. And if you look at the picture on the right, it illustrates that any tissue, any organ in our body can be affected by um, the immune system being active and it can manifest as symptoms and signs similar to autoimmune disease. A lot of times, patients on immunotherapy will experience side effects, but they tend to be mild or moderate. And the common side effects include rashes and diarrhea. A small group of patients, though, develop serious and life-threatening conditions, so we have to be vigilant for all our patients. While we have many treatment options for liver cancer, 
wouldn't it be better if we could prevent that from even developing in the first place? If you recall the discussion we had earlier about the risk factors for liver cancer, there's actually a lot of things that we can do to reduce our risk. For example, drinking in moderation, if at all, getting our hepatitis B vaccinations, if that hasn't been done, reducing the exposure to hepatitis B or C viruses, for example, no intravenous drug use, seeking safe and clean piercing or tattoo shops, knowing the health status of your sexual partner, and if diagnosed with hepatitis B or C infection, get that treated early. For those of us who have hepatitis B or C virus infections or liver cirrhosis, check with your doctors about screening for liver cancer. Typically, that involves a simple blood test, an ultrasound scan, six monthly, and can be done at the polyclinic even. Okay. And um, in Singapore, the hepatitis B vaccine is easily accessible. What is needed is just three injections to get yourself protected against this virus. The first in the, after the first injection, there's a follow-up one a month later, and then another five months later. Singapore's vaccination program for babies included the hepatitis B vaccine since 1987, and that has seen a decrease in incidence of infections. So with that, I come to the end of uh, my talk, and these are some take-home messages I hope you bring back. At the end of the day, I'd like to emphasize that it is possible for us to reduce our risk of developing liver cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you very much. That's very informative. Um, we Please do send your questions and uh, we will answer them at the end of the talk. Um, next, we have our um, TCM, Mr. Eric Tan. Mr. Tan will be talking the role of traditional Chinese medicine in cancer treatment. Over to you, Mr. Tan. Hi, good evening, everyone. Today, I'm going to share with you on how TCM view tumour. So have, let's just have a, some background of tumour in terms of TCM. The word tumour, Liu, in TCM dated very, very far back, right, at, right back to the auricular bone script. So when you, look at, when you look at the word Liu on the right, the one, the very early days Liu, you can actually visualise it. The, the word actually means a villager enters through a door and there's uh, two beds around there. So it means that uh, Liu is a, in, in history, it, uh, early people already un understand that Liu is something that is a form of a chronic illness that is there to stay. So that's, that's why there's two beds for and a villager to stay there. And in our early Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine record, the Huang Di Neijing, inner canons of Ch Yellow Red Emperor, it's stated that tumour is a lump that stays. It may accumulate as a mass and does not disappear. So, it's, so right from the beginning, uh, Chinese medicine already have uh, this understanding of tumour and have been uh, treat, treating tumour as a form of uh, illness. And they refer tumour as a different uh, form, like uh, in the record there's a zhen jia, and all these are the terms that describe gastrointestinal tumour. For traditional Chinese medicine, we see that a very strong vital qi is essential against tumour. So when the qi in the body is strong, detrimental elements cannot do harm to the body. Where they come from, they will return. So, and, and, and Ch Chinese medicine view us as a part of a nature. So whatever harmful elements from the nature come, it cannot affect us and it will be reflected off. So this is an illustration of how a strong essential qi keeps our body away from tumour and harm from radiation, pollutants and other forms of uh, cancer-causing particles. So internally, we also have other factors that can stimulate or trigger a tumour formation. But with a strong essential qi, uh, some elements like, uh, that can cause harm due to emotion, stress, poor, poor dietary habits, 
or hereditary, with a strong internal chi, we are able to suppress these elements and keep the body strong and away from the, and reduce the chance of formation of a tumor. So now let's look at how tumor is formed and how TCM uh, see the formation of tumor. So when exposed to external factors such as uh, radiation, uh, pollutant, industrial, uh, we, in TCM we call this Liu uh, Ying Xie which is the uh, external source of harm. So if let's say we don't have a good, strong uh, vital strength, vital qi, you can see from the illustration that harmful particles can enter the body. And, and as it enters the body, it will cause uh, the imbalance of uh, yin and yang. The regulation of yin and yang will not be there. And without the proper balance of yin and yang, in Chinese medicine, yin and yang, balance of yin and yang is crucial for the uh, supporting a healthy uh, human body. So with an with, with, uh, imbalance of yin and yang, the qi and blood flow is, will be disrupted. <clears throat> and with a slow flowing of qi and, and blood, the accumulation of uh, phlegm, fluid, clots will start to form. And this is in Chinese medicine term, we call it uh, tan, qi, and uh, uh, yu xie. So, these together, over time, they accumulate and form a mass, which we call it uh, zhong liu, uh, which is a tumor, zhong kuai. So, uh, also like I mentioned just now, like how our emotion, emotion can harm. Like when we feel stress or tense up, you can feel the whole body, all the muscles start to tense up, contract. Yeah, so the same thing applies. <clears throat> when, when we are feel when we are faced with stress, emotion, emotional thoughts, and uh, overworking, over a, over a long period of time, it will cause a stagnation of qi in the body. And same thing, this stagnation of qi cannot be circulated well around the body, and it will accumulate phlegm, clots, and will, same thing, it will form a tumor. So this is how uh, we, we have to keep ourselves relaxed, and it helps to boost immunity if we have a we control our emotional well, emotion well. So next we go into the diet side. So for now, they, because uh, TCM view a human being as a part of nature. So anything that is uh, like nowadays, we have a lot of processed food, like hot dogs, ham, all those, which is uh, considered artificial food. And this food is uh, not a part of the nature diet, natural diet. So when it enters the body, it will cause harm, harm to the spleen. So the spleen in TCM function as a qi regulation uh, organ. So it will regulate the flow of qi up and down, and it controls the formation of a uh, uh, tan, uh, with a phlegm, which is uh, something that, uh, that, will, that will form due to the uh, poor distribution of uh, fluid around the body. So uh, with, a, with a weaker spleen, uh, these fluid particles and uh, this uh, tan and this uh, phlegm will start to form and accumulate together and it will build up and cause a, cause a stagnation of qi and blood around the body resulting in uh, also formation of clots and over time it will lead to a formation of tumor. Finally, uh, for people faced with uh, long-term illness or those, and if the immunity, because uh, over, the, uh, over the time, as the people get sick, sick is usually caused by uh, external factors, uh, and these external factors usually harm the vital qi in the body. So while fighting against this, uh, <laughs> these elements, the body loses, loses the strength. So over the time, if uh, immunity is compromised, the the qi flow and the uh, accumulation of uh, phlegm uh, and, and fluid particles, clots in the body will form uh, a mass in the body and result in the trigger the, in the, trigger the formation of a tumor. So how do we prevent uh, tumor formation in uh, TCM? Yes, in TCM we have uh, two principles in the uh, prevention of tumor and also against tumor. 
So we fu zheng, we support the essential qi, and while uh, getting rid of the detrimental elements, which is the xie qi. So how do we do that? So <clears throat> we have to ensure that we have sufficient rest. Like just now we mentioned that emotional stress, overworking, and hectic lifestyle, all this, because all this will, <clears throat> will cause the body to uh, qi to weaken and also use up the, our amount of uh, vital strength in the body. So we, have, we should have a sufficient rest and have a high, healthy diet uh, rich in uh, fibers and uh, antioxidants. So for uh, herbs in Chinese medicine that can help to boost uh, immunity includes uh, lingzhi, cordyceps, and also we have uh, another form of, uh, uh, which is uh, yunzi. Yunzi is now commonly used uh, to help in the cancer recovery also. Yeah, and uh, but remember, if you buy cordyceps or lingzhi or these products, uh, there's a lot of fake in the markets. Uh. So it's better to check and buy from the credible source uh, because uh, some of them you may sell you at a cheaper price because usually people take uh, mm, take herbs to boost immunity is for a long term and they will uh, and they cannot afford a too high the price, so they will go for the cheap form and usually which is uh, even worse and you will compromise your health and. Instead of uh, being beneficial to the body, you end up doing harm to the body. So when you buy this kind of herbs, try to go for the credible source. Okay? <clears throat> yeah, so also avoid uh, processed meat that uh, I mentioned just now. It may hurt the uh, spleen function, which, is, which will regulate the qi around the body. Okay, and quit smoking also. Because, uh, smoking is also, the, the, as you smoke a cigarette, the smoke is also considered an external form of a xie qi, an external form of a detrimental elements that may cause harm to your body. And another natural way of uh, boosting immunity is to do exercise. When you do exercise, you promote the blood circulation around the body and recovery and the body will uh, recover by, by itself better and able to, to be stronger in the fight against other uh, external elements that may cause harm to the human body. Okay, so with that, now we look at uh, how uh, traditional Chinese medicine can help to deal with a uh, side effect of chemotherapy. As you all know, uh, chemotherapy that comes with a lot of, we uh, experience certain side effects. So we will take a closer look at this. Yes, one of the common one is uh, dry throat, dry eyes. Okay, for those one on chemotherapy, in order to reduce the effect of uh, Dry, no, uh, dry eyes, dry skin, dry throat. It is best, it's recommended to sleep at, to be uh, asleep at this, during this period of time, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Because in uh, Chinese, uh, medicine, uh, Chinese uh, way of uh, supporting the body, this period of time, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. is the period where the body recovers, the gan <clears throat> and uh, uh, recovers and uh, and refresh itself. So during this period of time, is the, if you start to do work or you start uh, staying up late, watch, watching TV, all those, you end up burning the, the ink, which is the fluid in the liver, which cause the dry eyes and uh, throat, all those. Because uh, for eyes uh, in TCM, liver is very, very closely related organs to the eye. Okay, and also for those that uh, often feel skin dry, dryness, can also try uh, bird nest, uh, but also if you want to try bird nest or other things, you may want to uh, consult your doctor and discuss with him, see the suitability of uh, you having a bird nest. And also, if you try bird nest, remember to go for the credible source, because bird nest, sometimes the, there's a lot of uh, fake ones, or they're made of gelatins or jelly, or some even like, they, are, they come in flakes, but they glue, they use glue to glue together to make it a whole. So uh, you may end up uh, buying uh, some not so relevant uh, products which may not even be any of any use to you. Okay? Yeah, and you, you see on the right, there's a gochi. Gochi is a very, uh, in Chinese med medicine side, is a very good uh, for, uh, for improving the strength and help to for, uh, improve uh, dry eyes. Okay, okay, gochi actually sometimes if you want to use it, you can use uh, for frying dishes like uh, cooking vegetable, add some sprinkle and just uh, take it as a uh, food. Uh. 
So you will you also add flavor to your food and make it a, a bit of uh, add a bit of uh, sweetness to it. Uh. And uh, goji also sometimes, but uh, it, it has some oil in it. So usually for those elderly with a uh, constipation problem, it may help in the uh, reduce the problem as well. Uh, next also, we have a lot of uh, people who undergo chemotherapy and have uh, this fatigue and tiredness. Yeah, so I uh, can have uh, the, when appropriate uh, exercise to boost up the chi in the body. And uh, you may also try out some warm soup, uh, but uh, it, it is best to discuss uh, the ingredient of the soup uh, with a doctor or uh, consult some uh, uh, professional tradi traditional Chinese physician for some advice because uh, you need to be suitable for your body because uh, uh, some of the we, we are not sure whether your body after chemotherapy is uh, suitable for that kind of uh, treatment yeah so uh, as you can see on the right side that's a uh, cordycep yeah that cordycep is also a, a very good uh, immunity boosting herbs uh, especially like let's say uh, for elderly is like one to is a not it can be good also for those prevention elderly and also for the those recovery and not on uh, to pre prevent the recurrence of a uh, uh, the tumor formation. Yeah. Yeah. Next, we have uh, this. Uh, also, it's very common to see uh, people who went undergo chemotherapy as this vomiting and loss of appetite. Yeah, and uh, it's <clears throat> to uh, deal with this. Sometimes you can add a bit of ginger in your cooking so that it helps to uh, elevate this. Uh, this uh, relieve this problem of uh, vomiting and also. Increase appetite. Yeah, so uh, in Chinese medicine, uh, Chinese uh, TCM, we also have a acute point which we call it the uh, Nei Guan. Uh, it's a uh, you, you can uh, which you can apply on your palm. You look at the wrist, the line on the wrist, and three finger down. Yes, and it's right in the middle there. Yeah, you can just use um, a gentle strength and massage it. Yeah, it can use it can helps to relieve uh, vomiting and. It helps to uh, make you open up your chest and so that you won't feel the urge for vomiting. And it's also very good for like those uh, who go who have this uh, motion sickness and like feel a bit giddiness and vomiting uh, during the journey and so forth. Yeah. And also like, you can see on the right side this Chinese yam. This Chinese yam is also a very very good food. Uh, you can actually there's two forms. One is the dry form. Dry form you can buy from a Credible uh, herbal uh, store, TCM store, and the uh, the fresh form you can buy from the supermarket. You can actually cut into cubes and put in porridge. It will help to improve the appetite and also uh, also uh, help uh, boost the spleen, the chi of the spleen, and also increase the immunity of the body. Yeah, uh, the dry form you can use uh, for the brewing in the soup. Uh, I say porridge, you can also use. Uh, and also uh, help to keep the protect the liver and improve the vitality of the human. Yeah. Oh, finally, we have this uh, hair loss. Hair loss is a, uh, but hair loss it varies according to individual. We have some 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 uh, people react more to the chemotherapy treatment and have face a. Uh, greater hair loss and while some doesn't have any effect on the hair loss. So for those with a hair loss problem, yeah, you, you, you can try a herbal shampoo or go for a herbal shampoo, massage on the acute point to help uh, relieve the, uh, to help activate uh, the follicles for hair growth and uh, prevent, uh, to strengthen the roots of the hair. Yeah. And usually for uh, those shampoo, herbal shampoo, uh, main ingredient including uh, the one you see on the right, so tea. Uh, you have he so wu, ce bai ye, and sometimes you have han lian chao, nu zhen. It depends on uh, what kind of herbal shampoo you buy. But it, when you buy this kind of shampoo, always buy from the credible source. Because uh, some from the streets, all those, they can use other things that they're just fake, just for marketing purpose, they just use, uh, uh, they just uh, quote a certain uh, Chinese traditional herbs that put in that, and 
yeah, sell it cheap to you. And also, uh, when you when you use a shampoo or those, you can try just a bit of drop before you use. Test for whether you are allergic to it. Yeah, just a drop, put on your skin, and see after a while, 10, 15 minutes, whether there's a redness or so. If if there is, then don't use because you might be allergic to the the herbs or something like that. Yes, and also like I said, uh, those cheap ones sometimes they may not wash or something. Like that. So there's also contaminants or something. So buy always buy this herbal sh uh, shampoo and spa from those uh, credible source. Yeah, uh, and that's all I'm going to share with, have to share with you today. Oh, thank you, Miss Tan from you. A dietitian from Fair Park Hospital, Miss Rachel Ong, over to you. So tonight, this evening, my topic will be debunking cancer diet myths. Okay, so I picked the top ten. A uh, top eight cancer diet myths that is commonly asked among patients. So we'll go through each one in detail. We'll talk a little bit about sugar, superfoods, artificial sweeteners, soy products, alkaline diet and water, organic food, the safety of microwave foods, and also a bit about dietary supplements. Okay, perhaps the most common myth that we hear out there, sugar feeds cancer. We can see from the photos on the screen, Actually, sugar, or when broken down into glucose, is found in many, many different types of foods. For example, our whole grains, our bread, starches, rice, even our fruits and vegetables, certain vegetables, uh, our dairy products like our milk and yogurts, and of course, added sugars like our pastry and confectionery. So the myth comes from the idea that the cancer cells are rapidly growing, and they actually use large amount of glucose for growth. However, cancer cells not need need only, not only glucose, but protein and fats to grow as well. So avoiding all carbohydrate foods will actually deprive your healthy cells of energy, which is necessary for recovery. There's actually no evidence that a sugar-free diet lowers the risk of getting cancer or boosts your chances of survival if you are diagnosed. We cannot control actually which cells use glucose and which do not. So healthy cells need glucose as fuel as well. So if we avoid all sugar foods, we're actually starving our healthy cells in the process, and that's not good. We'll be in a state of malnutrition. However, excessive intake may lead to obesity, which can increase your cancer risk if you put on weight. And the idea is actually to choose more whole grains. For example, our brown rice, our wholemeal bread, our oatmeal, which are high in fiber, vitamins, and minerals as well. So not to avoid sugar foods totally. Okay, coming up to our next myth, artificial sweeteners cause cancer. So artificial sweeteners more commonly uh, formed from chemical base or natural compounds. They give us the sweet taste without as many calories. So the more common ones found are our diet drinks. So like we can find them in our Coke Light, Coke Zero, Pepsi Black, and our candy. So we can see like sugar-free candies, ice creams or diabetic food products. So it can be found in like diabetic jam or sweeteners for them, or even biscuits and crackers suitable for diabetics. So the sugar substitutes that are commonly available in Singapore include the most common one, as we all may know, Eco Aspartame, Saturine Sucralose in Splendor, Stevia, and also Xylitol. So we may see some of this in the market. So there's actually no scientific evidence that artificial sweeteners can cause cancer in humans. They are a good alternative for people with diabetes. They provide the sweetness, but they do not raise the blood sugar levels of these patients. So it's a choice because some patients do enjoy their cup of tea with a bit of sweetness or coffee. So this is an option for them. The sweeteners in our food products are safe for consumption and approved by our regulatory body here, which is the Singapore Food Agency, SFA. And Health Promotion Board actually says that sugar substitutes are safe for the general public when consumed in moderate amounts. So if you have one or two sachets a day, like in your cup of coffee or tea, that is absolutely fine. Our next myth is that eating more acidic food promotes cancer growth. Okay, so that's where you get the advent of this idea of the alkaline diet. It's based on a theory that acidic food can alter the body's pH level and promote cancer. So they actually base this myth on lab studies. They isolate cancer cells and they actually show that they thrive in low pH environment, but they cannot survive in alkaline situations. 
So this alkaline so-called diet, they promote a diet high in fruits, vegetables, nuts and legumes. And to avoid all meat, poultry, fish, dairy, eggs, grains and alcohol, whereas our fats and oils, starches and sugars are considered as neutral. Okay, so building on that, we have our alkaline water as well. It's quite common these days if you go into a supermarket, you can see. So what is actually alkaline water? Alkaline water has a higher pH level than tap water, as we can see from the pH chart over there. So the neutral, our tap water is about 7.0, alkaline is slightly higher at 8 to 9. And then there has been claims that alkaline water helps with weight loss, to help your body to detox, and even fight cancer. So how is this alkaline water actually made? It can come naturally from natural spring waters, depend from the, depends on the source of it. It can be made by adding like baking soda to tap water, or even using water ionizing machines or specific filtration system. Okay, so actually this is a myth because the body maintains the optimal blood pH regardless of the diet. Your urine pH may be affected by the diet, but not the blood. So your, your human body will not tolerate any out of the line pH in either direction, otherwise you'll be really ill, really sick, and the cells and metabolic processes cannot function otherwise. So actually our kidneys, our lungs and our brains help us to maintain this uh, acid-base balance. There's actually no scientific evidence that supports the effectiveness of safety of this alkaline diet, although it does encourage uh, fruits and vegetables, but so do all healthy eating patterns. So we can adopt some of it, but not the alkaline portion. Okay, our next myth is eating organic food can lower cancer risk. Okay, so I think the concern here is more on the residue of pesticides. Yeah? Organic foods are grown without the use of pesticides and man-made fertilizers. Okay, they're more expensive because they're more expensive to grow. Sometimes they take a longer time as well. Non-organic foods are grown with conventional methods using pesticide and fertilizers, so sometimes the yield of the food is much more compared to organic foods. However, if the pesticide is a concern, the residue is insignificant once you actually wash your fruits and vegetables properly. So we get this question quite a lot as well. So the general advice is if you do a 30 seconds rinse over the tap of your fruit and vegetables, and if you're concerned, followed by a 15 minute soak as well, and finally, a final rinse will help to remove a significant portion of the pesticide residue. So for your, for your root vegetables, more like your potatoes and more tubers and things like that, so using a vegetable brush to brush off the external portions of dirt will be helpful as well before you carry out this 30 second rinse and soak. So that should eliminate most of the pesticide residue. Okay, there's actually no evidence that shows that eating organic food reduces cancer risk. All fruits and vegetables have, we you know, cancer protective benefits. All right, some organic foods may contain slightly higher levels of antioxidants, depends on the soil level they are grown. Okay, but however, if you compare organic versus non-organic foods, there's actually no significant nutrition difference between them. Okay, and actually the benefits of fruits and vegetables consumption outweighs the risk of the residue. So actually, if you wash them properly, so the benefits actually outweighs the risk. So no worries. Our next myth is eating superfoods prevents cancers. So superfoods, usually this label is, is placed on foods, but actually they have no scientific basis or regulated definition of superfoods. It's more like a marketing tool. Okay, these so-called superfoods, they offer high level of desirable nutrients. They sometimes claim to be linked to a prevention of disease or believed to have several simultaneous health benefits as well. So examples are like acai berry, pomegranate, blueberries, broccoli, raspberries, or sometimes even green tea can be considered labeled as a superfood. Okay, some compounds like example curcumin and turmeric in certain studies have been shown to affect cancer cells in lab studies. But we need to know that these studies are very limited and in an isolated setting. And sometimes the dose and frequency of these is, is not applicable in the diet. So the general idea is actually there's no good evidence that any one particular food in, in particular prevents cancer, including those that have been slapped on the labels superfoods. The bottom line is the risk of cancer can be reduced by keeping a healthy weight, eating a healthy balanced diet. 
So no doubt these foods can be very colourful in your diet. It's a good choice to include them as part of a healthy plate as we can see in the health promotion board picture on the right over there. So it is okay to include these foods as part of your healthy balanced diet but keep in mind that no one particular food can help to prevent cancer. Our next myth, eating soy products increase breast cancer risk. Okay, so soy products contain these chemicals called isoflavones. They're actually similar to estrogen, but they're in the plant form, plant estrogen. And studies show that actually high levels of estrogen has been linked to an increased risk of breast cancer. However, food sources of soy products do not contain the isoflavones levels high enough to increase breast cancer risk. There are certain studies that show that there's a link between soy or isoflavone supplements and an increased risk of breast cancer in women who have a family history or personal history of breast cancer or thyroid problems. And these are often in high doses as they are in supplement form. So there's currently no evidence to show that natural soy foods such as soybeans, soy milk and tofu increase breast cancer or cancer reoccurrence. They are a very good source of protein, especially for people who follow a vegetarian or vegan diet, or the more popular trend towards a plant-based diet these days. So the recommendation is actually to eat a moderate amount of whole soil foods, one to two servings a day, and that does not increase your risk of breast cancer. So one serving of soy food can be like a 150 gram block of tofu, or a glass of soy milk, or like a half a cup of idamame. Yes, so one to two servings per day does not increase your risk of breast cancer. Our next myth we carry on, microwave foods cause cancer. Some people are afraid to even buy a microwave at home because they fear that you know, they cause radiation and cancer. Okay, so how, first, of, first of all, we explore how do microwaves actually work. The electromagnetic energy, when we press the on button, similar to radio waves, heat up the water molecules from the food. So these water molecules actually bounce around, resulting in the warming of our food. So, but when the microwave oven is turned off or when the heating process is over, it's actually not radioactive, the oven itself. Okay, so when following precautions when using a microwave, we have to be, be cautious to use only microwave safe containers. So we store our food, some, some, some people might store their leftovers in containers like margarine containers or even ice cream plastic containers. So it's good to know that we try not to warm it up in that container itself. It's better to transfer it to a microwave safe container or even better something glass or ceramic which is microwave safe definitely. So try not to use plastic wraps or containers that may melt and leak into the food. So the question is, is the food cooked in the microwave safe? Yes, food cooked in the microwave is very safe and has actually the same nutrient value as food cooked in any conventional oven. Okay, so it does not become radioactive and does not damage your DNA. There's, there's no research that shows that the link between the use of microwave ovens or food and the development of cancer. And actually the food that we heat up is unaltered, so the, the DNA is actually not changed, so it remains free from the effects that can cause cancer. Okay. Our, our next myth is actually dietary supplements can help fight cancer. As we know, there's no dietary or herbal product that can cure cancer, and certain herbs actually might interact with the chemotherapy and other drug treatments, and antioxidant supplements may actually make cancer treatments less effective. So sometimes too much of a good thing may not be a good thing after all. Okay, so consult your physician and make sure your, your doctor knows that if you are taking any of the alternate herbal therapy or antioxidant supplements. In certain groups of people, certain vitamin supplements may be needed in, in the case of deficiencies like vitamin D or vitamin B12 for our elderly or those vegetarians as well. So in such cases, certain, certainly they may be needed. But otherwise, otherwise, try to avoid any antioxidant supplement megadoses. Okay, there's no evidence to suggest that popping supplements can reduce your cancer risk. For most people, consumption of the right type of food and drink is more likely to protect against cancer than any dietary supplement. Our World Cancer Research Fund actually says that the high-dose dietary supplements are not recommended and we should all aim to meet our nutritional needs through our diet alone. 
Okay, so that was our last myth. Just a, just a brief idea on how to actually find reliable and nutrition cancer information in this day and age. So consider the source of the information, where it, where it comes from. Is it a personal testimonial? Is it a forwarded WhatsApp message? And if you're surfing the web, uh, the websites you serve, is it a blog post or is it actually a government or educational website? So usually websites ending in, ending in like .gov, like government websites or educational edu, use evidence-based research for the recommendations. So these are more the trustworthy ones. Okay, we have to look out for red flags out there. What are the very common red flags? Something that proves a promise you a quick fix. Okay, they give very unrealistic claims or they promote advice that cuts out dietary food groups altogether or focus on specific foods or supplements to relieve your nutritional problems, okay? So these are out the red flags out there. And of course, personal testimonies out there. Sometimes people write blog posts and things like that. We have to be very careful and not spread the misinformation around. Okay, so we have to check our author's credentials. Sometimes the people who are bloggers or like fitness gurus, things like that. So we have to really check where the information comes from and their qualifications. And of course, the date and the website of the article as well. Okay, so in summary, about a third of all cancers can be prevented by having a healthy diet, eating well, staying active and maintaining a healthy body weight. You can re reduce your risk of cancer or cancer reoccurrence by making sure we practice eating a variety and a balanced diet, fruits and vegetables especially, whole grains, limiting your intake of refined sugars and processed foods, staying physically active is very important, maintaining a healthy body weight, and of course, avoiding smoking and limiting your alcohol intake. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. We have come to our Q&A. Uh, let me start with you then, since you've just finished. Should a cancer survivor or a cancer patient avoid consumption of dairy products? There's actually no good evidence to avoid dairy products per se. Dairy products are a good source of protein and also for cancer patients, especially for those with very poor intake, they find that they got nausea and poor intake. We usually encourage a nourishing fluids throughout the day. So these can come in the form of nourishing foods like yogurt drinks or even milk-based dairy products per se. So these are good source of nutrition for them. There's no good evidence to avoid them. So, in a TCM perspective, so Eric, you know, do you do you encourage or you know suggest that people who are in treatment for cancer to consume uh, dairy products? Uh, actually, there's no uh, no whether it, we support or it's just uh, you take it as uh, everything is have to be in moderation because uh, if uh, let's say if you are not feeling well or mm -hmm. have some allergy to that, then it's still not advisable. Or if you seek a professional uh, doctor's uh, advice or traditional Chinese physician advice on uh, whether I should take or uh, if let's say you whether uh, the body is suitable for the kind of uh, so mm. in, in Chinese medicine or traditional Chinese medicine uh, you do not actually discourage people from consuming dairy products yeah, like yes. milk or yogurt etc ah, yes. okay thank you I mean the next big thing or the current big thing is keto diet ketosis uh, you know would keto diet prevent cancer or can cancer patient goes on a keto diet Keto diet is actually a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Okay, so if in terms of cancer, it's only in a very experimental stage. Very small studies have been done, so it's not going to be widely promoted. And moreover, for these cancer patients having low appetite and nausea, if you ask them to eat a very high fat diet, they're not likely to they're likely to face a lot of nausea, GI disturbances, things like that. And also from the micronutrient, which is your vitamin and minerals perspective, a keto diet does not provide enough like fruits and vegetables per se mm -hmm. as a form of a healthy mm -hmm. diet. So we definitely do not recommend it. But if you do want to embark on it, it's, it's so-called a medical diet. So do consult your oncologist. So over to the oncologist then. <laughs> keto diet and cancer patient. I think I have to agree with Rachel. At the end of the day, a balanced diet is important. And if there are already side effects we are facing from chemotherapy, then restricting ourselves to a diet that is quite difficult to upkeep wouldn't be recommended. So given the fact that, you know, uh, a lot of times when people have developed liver cancer, it has been a very final or very late stage, you know, and uh, do you think that for having regular screening uh, would actually prevent liver cancer? 
Well, there is a screening program that uh, is catered to patients who are at higher risk. For example, patients who have hepatitis B, chronic carriage, or if they have underlying liver cirrhosis. And that would be useful because liver cancer, if detected early, is actually curable in some cases. So, fatty liver, hepatitis, are these people with these uh, conditions higher risk of contracting uh, liver cancer? At the end of the day, one of the most um, common um, predisposing factors to developing liver cancer would be people who have underlying damaged livers that are scarred for fibrosis to become cirrhosis, and so, in this setting, if the hepat chronic hepatitis is left to continue causing inflammation and damage to the liver, or a fatty buildup in the liver results in inflammation, all this, yes, increases the risk of liver cancer. So sometimes they have a, a scan and they said that, oh, there's a bubble in the liver or there's a cyst in the liver. Are they dangerous? How to, you know, cure them? So there, a lot of times, uh, cysts are what we call benign, meaning cysts are not cancerous and they may not, never cause symptoms. If they are small and they remain stable, we can leave them alone. Um, uncommon, sometimes there are patients who have many or large cysts that can cause symptoms and problems. Only in those situations do we need to intervene. I see. Um, so coming back to this, uh, so we have an oncologist here, yeah, we have a TCM you know, over here. And this is a very common question of all the years since 2008 that I have been you know, hosting the awareness program, the education program, is that can we combine Western medication with TCM together? What I saw just now, Eric, is that you are actually encouraging a food therapy with Chinese herbs or Chinese food per se, as compared to you know, um, like Chinese medicine, medicine. Uh, do you have anything to add on in terms of that or clarify that? Yeah. Actually, uh, because uh, every cancer patient, the, the, the kind of treatment is different. So, uh, so it, it's good to uh, discuss with the oncology on uh, what kind of, whether it is suitable. So just now, those are listed as uh, some of the recommendations. So uh, if some, for, for example, some uh, oncology may say uh, you can uh, you can complement with uh, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, but if let's say uh, during a treatment process, it's still advisable. If let's say a doctor support the, the TCM treatment, it would be good to take it during the break period instead of during the uh, during the treatment period. Yeah, so it's uh, so called during the rest and not say together with uh, because and in traditional Chinese medicine, for what we 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 it, because it's, they're already seeking. Uh, Western treatment, so we don't like attack on the tumor. We would uh, what what we boost uh, we advocate is like uh, we raise the vitality of the uh, of the the chi of the of the body to uh, to protect against like uh, side effects. Uh, also, uh, maybe uh, after post post cancer, the recovery to prevent the recurrence. Yeah, more on that sort. Do you get a lot of inquiry? Can I try this Chinese medicine? Can I do this TCM when I'm doing my key aromatherapy so I can prevent hair loss? I can have double my opportunity of recovery. Do you get a lot of those? Definitely. And a lot of times, uh, we'll be very honest, we don't know how these traditional medications interact with our uh, chemotherapy. And so, in the end, there are still patients who will opt to be on both Western and traditional Chinese therapy. And very close monitoring will be indicated in that situation because Western medications can also cause um, side effects including liver injury, um, other organ dysfunction and with that, if there are too many um, things happening in the patient at the same time, it's difficult to pinpoint what the issue is. Of course, the best situation would be if these medications complement each other to result in the best outcome for our patients. Yeah. Um, the other question I have is this, how? do you actually increase your essential vital you know, strength? I know that you have sleeping, you know, exercise, etc. Is, that, is there anything else? You know, what can you eat? What can you do more you know, to increase that so that you have this invincible chi you know, to, to fight anything that's coming? Uh, that, that's a very good thing to say, but uh, unfortunately in this uh, hectic society, we have uh, stress. 
So it's a way of uh, managing our mental health, our stress, uh, stress, and at the same time, a lot of people say I don't have uh, time for exercise or those, which I think is uh, good to at least uh, set aside a small portion of time every day to do some exercise. And food wise, try to eat like just now I mentioned because uh, we view. Uh, whole human body, a healthy human body, as part of uh, nature. So what we eat should be natural and not so uh, uh, those uh, with those ad additive uh, chemicals which is uh, the body cannot respond and uh, it, it may cause uh, 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 the illness and all, so, so, all sorts of things. Yeah. I see. And we have a question here. Sorry, continue. Yeah, uh, maintaining a very positive uh, mentality is the best, <laughs> important, most important thing. So you need to see yeah. a happy yes. doctor for that. Uh, you know, this is a question, a gentleman with a low-grade fatty liver. Um, I mean, the wife say he's okay now, but the doctor has said to him that, you know, do not consume TCM. It, 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 what do you think? Why is it so? Is this common when you have a fatty liver? Do not use TCM, or TCM could have added something to help to combat fatty liver. Uh, for for the case, you have to uh, get a, seek a professional, traditional physician help uh, because you need a proper analysis and certain reports. Because TCM, if let's say we that's a Western liver report and stating mm. stating there's a liver failure, this sort, mm. usually we will be very careful in the treatment because. Uh, the T TCM uh, actually uh, uh, also works, uh, makes the liver work uh, uh, to a certain extent, even though, uh, and because uh, also if let's say improper treatment, like so excessive amount or uh, those, uh, so it's good to have a credible and a professional, seek a professional TCM treatment if you really want to see if you have a liver. Especially if your liver, because uh, liver is uh, clearing away all the Toxin. toxins and the herbs, sometimes uh, the interaction may be there. So it's better to seek a proper professional advice. Do you see a lot of patients that come to you trying to seek second opinion versus the first opinion is Western medicine? Uh, usually, uh, sometimes uh, when it comes to cancer, comes seek second opinion usually uh, Sometimes it's uh, when they are at the very late stage of uh, cancer or something like that because uh, further treatment or chemo will even weaker and, <clears throat> and deteriorate the quality of life of the. So in this case, usually they will turn to uh, Chinese medicine and we will see how. And because at, at this stage, is usually the patient is at the weak, weaker state. So usually we also try to boost the chi and based on the. Because uh, different. Uh, Patients they have different body constituency and different uh, at different state and different body conditions, so we have to assess and treat accordingly. So let me ask you a TCM question per se is that do you encourage you know people go for a massage to feel relaxed and things like that? Do you think that it is advisable for people to see a TCM to sort of you know mediate the chi in their body as a kind of maintenance on a long-term basis yeah so uh, actually this is a very difficult to answer topic because uh, nowadays there's a lot of uh, massage they use the word TCM whether they are, they are really trained or it's just a normal so we're not so sure so if uh, let's say if for normal relaxation I like say just a uh, it, it's so uh, for me, say once in a while, moderation is okay. But if it's let's say they say that it's for treatment of certain illness or those, it's better to go for a proper one uh, with a registered uh, TCM, a physician or something. Not not just a normal neighborhood. Yeah. <clears throat> so so that, registered uh, TCM, good TCM, registered <laughs> reputable TCM. Do, would they become a, a possible source or possible avenue for maintenance of um, a person's vitality? Uh, yes, uh, I would say uh, you have to, it, it depends on individuals uh, sometimes uh, uh, because a very good communication is very essential. So if you, you must be, find a trustable, trusted one, the, mm -hmm. the physician you trust. So you are more confident because once you start to worry about this, uh, sometimes because uh, when you start to want to get better, get, want to get well fast, uh, you may end up so, so called like getting a more negative effect instead of a positive one also. So uh, it, it, it really depends. Uh, sometimes like, like let's say uh, a person may visit this physician for a certain condition. 
it may work for him, but it may not work for another. So like person. car maintenance, you go to the same mechanic. So it's a very reputable TCM. It's good. Is it good to see a TCM for maintenance? That means I'm not sick, but it's for maintenance to boost my vitality, strength, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you encourage that in uh, TCM perspective? Yes, actually. Uh, but it, it it would be good to uh, not hop around. And, yeah. So yeah, one yes. person, I like the person TCM. It's a reputable reputable TCM. The question here is that: Do you encourage that as a regular? Maintenance. That means you know to have that kind of uh, checking. You know your your chi going up and down. You know doing different boosters to make sure that you regulate your vital uh, vital strength, etc. Do you encourage that, or you say you only come and see us when you're sick? Please don't uh, come and see us when you're not. TCM, we are more in the prevention. Precisely. That's yes. what I'm saying. For prevention, for maintenance, do you encourage that? You think that you know people should see a TCM for that matter? Yes. Uh, a yes. person uh, should go and see the PCM and get it assessed. So sometimes also when the TCM see some abnormality, it, we are not just like uh, I only see TCM. It's fine that something like eh, how come like the two the stools there's some the, maybe sometimes the patient will say I have bloody stool or something. Ah, then TCM may a train a, a train a, a professional TCM physician will, will say ah you have to go and look for. So you a refer a Western yeah, doctor, yes. correct? Yes. Ah, okay. So that's great. So I thank you for for that. Liver cancer, do, do you have, do you classify them into different stages? What are the different stages? Yes, we do. As with every cancer, there are different stages. But what's interesting about liver cancer and what may be more relevant in the treatment of liver cancer is actually also to understand what the underlying liver condition is like. Because a lot of our treatment options, um, we need an adequate liver function in order to be able to tolerate, for example, a surgery or a local directed therapy or even medications. So. If the tumour is uh, relatively small, but yet the patient's liver is very cirrhotic or very scarred, with very poor function, that will also limit our treatment in the end. So we have to take the patient as a whole um, and not just maybe the size of the tumour in itself. Are diabetic uh, patients a um, higher risk of uh, liver failure? So diabetics having a higher risk of liver failure, I mean there are many factors and many reasons why someone could have liver failure. Um, but if you're asking if diabetic patients may have a higher risk of developing liver cancer, I think the, the idea is that um, obesity, diabetes is associated with uh, fatty liver or non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver, which in the end, if left to um, fester and develop um, recurrent inflammation and fibrosis over time, will increase that risk. And taking statin for long term, would it be detrimental? Is it one of the cause to lead to liver cancer? So statins are cholesterol lowering medications mm -hmm. that a lot of people take to lower their cholesterol, to lower what we call cardiovascular risk. This is to reduce um, heart attacks, strokes. Um, and I think there was a period of time where people were worried that statins would cause liver injury and then cause liver cancer. It is true that statins can cause a liver injury, um, but at the end of the day, there hasn't been a concrete evidence to show that statins cause liver cancer. And in fact, um, there are also some um, studies that suggest that it could be beneficial in overall um, reducing the patient's cholesterol levels and maintaining health. Thank you. Over to you, Rachel. In the food paradise like Singapore, um, natural food is not enough. These days, we have R&D food. Are R&D food better? Would they be, you know, can, can they have more artificial colouring, flavouring that would cause, you know, liver failure or cancer causing? So all these uh, R&D foods you mentioned is more like the lab-grown, lab lab-based grown meats. These are actually still emerging in the market. So actually, there's actually not really many studies to show their, their many safety and efficacy. But if you're talking about uh, those out there, like example, your meat alternative like in a burger, we mm -hmm. have our meat alternative like impossible burgers, things mm -hmm. like that. They actually come from more soy base or our mock meat base or even fungus or micro protein base. So these are actually safe for consumption for the general public. And it's also an alternative for like uh, vegetarians or those that are going for more plant-based diets to consume. Um, it, would too much caffeine cause, you know, a liver problem? 
I think coffee addicts will be quite upset. But no, there's actually no study that show that actually caffeine can cause cancer. Mm -hmm. So everything in moderation, as we say. So if you're only drinking about one to two cups a day of your coffee or your favorite tea, that's actually absolutely fine. Be aware of not mega dosing on energy drinks and things like that. You have palpitation and other, other issues will come into play. Uh, okay. Um, I, have, I have a question here that is that... Um can liver patients actually eat sweet food and drinks? Sweet food. So sweet food is very subjective, like my slideshow. <laughs> sweet food is like can come in the form of fruits and vegetables. When it comes to, in the form of that, definitely yes. But of course, we try to avoid our refined sugars that can actually cause unnecessary weight gain, empty calories, and go for more the whole foods, our whole grains and things like that. Okay. So this is a very this is a very food based question. What kind of vegetables has the highest antibodies? A lot of people like to ask this kind of questions. <laughs> All vegetables are good for you, mm. so you aim for a variety and an multitude of colors. So yes. don't just go focus on one particular type of vegetable or fruit. Your diet should have a variety. That's the most important. Okay. Would any form of uh, vitamin deficiency actually increase the chances of um, liver cancer? I don't think it's a, it's a known um, risk. There are some toxins that may be found, for example, a certain fungus that is sometimes seen like aflatoxin. Yeah, that, if we consume it unwittingly, does increase the risk of liver cancer. So the million dollar question, does the air fryer cause cancer? <laughs> Not the liver cancer. Does the air fryer actually cause cancer? Anyone wants to take this question? I mean, there's an increased number of people using that. I know people use it to cook, you know, to have it low fat because you don't use oil, you reduce the, the fat in it, you know. So the question is that would, you know, um, um, air fryer be a risk? Are there enough research to show that air fryer is actually cancer causing? Not really for air fryer per se, but it's just another appliance to heat up the food, like, uh, like example for a convectional oven and so. So I don't think there's enough research to show that air fryer per se would cause cancer. It's more so the charred food that is causing the yes, cancer, definitely. right? definitely. That, that's something we want to avoid. Uh, so it's the charred food, not the air fryer. So we, we need to be really, really careful about it. Another question I have for Eric here is this. So define Chinese medicine. I know you've seen so, some of this, you know. Um, you know these days, like Tonka Ali, is it Chinese medicine? Yeah, uh, uh, Chinese traditional medicine, uh, they have this what, uh, guava leaves, soursop leaves and things like that. Do you classify them as traditional Chinese medicine? Uh, actually, uh, traditional Chinese medicine have the roots from the China side. So uh, besides Chinese medicine, actually uh, there's also other traditional medicine like Indian medicine, mm. traditional Malay medicine. Mm. So uh, Tonka Ali will say that it would, it's not part of a so-called Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine. What about the soursop leaf, you know, um, some leaves, it, I mean there's so many types of leaves, but you know, the soursop leaf for example, there is a lot of um, hype about it. Yeah. For some of the uh, uh, leaves, it can, or some of the, the what they read off can be passed down from maybe like the so-called Mingjian or so-called uh, those uh, traditional folk medicine or those, uh, which uh, is actually taken at their own risk. Uh, because, uh, we, we, the so they are folk medicine, but not Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine, would you say that traditionally you can actually find them in Li Shizhen? Yeah, so uh, it's all Chinese medicine, it's, it's all those uh, medicine listed in the Chinese medical, those recorded from the, uh, those uh, uh, traditional Chinese uh, passed down from the, the records, Chinese records. Yeah. So the most easy to understand is Ben Chao Gang Mu? Yes, uh, but there also, Ben uh, Chao Gang is the, <coughs> the largest collection. The largest yeah, collection. So, so the if you can medicine. find it in there, Chinese medicine. If you cannot find it there, maybe it's a folk medicine. Yeah, it, it, it's best to uh, seek, uh, if you're unsure, you can just seek uh, advice from the uh, trained traditional physician, Chinese medicine physician. Okay, so juicing, a good way to increase nutrient intake? So this is on the detox diet as well. So if you have a functioning <laughs> liver and the kidneys, you actually don't need to go on any special kind of detox diet. Those healthy organs actually do that for you. And if you're only drinking juice per se, it's actually very high in sugar. So it's something we tend to avoid. We always say, eat your fruits and vegetables, don't drink them. So that's a tip to take home. Okay. Um, so will hypothetical V vaccination help prevent a source of liver cancer? 
Unfortunately, we do not have a vaccine against hepatitis C. What mm -hmm. we have though is an effective hepatitis B infection. Yeah. I see. So that will be encouraged. So one more thing is this. Okay, I'm going for my health screening soon. Soon. And um, would you, what would you say, Ivy, you need to check your liver if it is healthy. What would be the test you would encourage me to run? So to be very honest, I think every patient um, should discuss with their family doctor mm. what they should go for. Mm. Okay, if there aren't any um, underlying risk factors, mm. then standard screening would in for cancers would include things like breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening. Mm. These are the large programs that mm. have been um, shown to um, be effective and encouraged for the general population. I see. Yeah, other than that, typically we would recommend um, the physicians to speak with each individual patient to see what they do, what they do need. So technically, when they start drawing blood, or rather they will draw blood uh, for, for, for health screening, they run many, many tests, right? Hepatitis, you know, cancer markers, etc. They will run all of this uh, just to have any indication. They will do the fit kit, you know, if your age is there. Um, you know, if there's any previous symptoms, they will do endoscopy or uh, uh, colonoscopy and things like that. These are the usual health checks, you know, per se, to make sure that, you know, um, that shows proper. When would you think, or should it be an alarm bell when somebody says, I need to send you for an ultrasound? Well, for the physician to want to send you for an ultrasound, commonly, uh, that would be because of underlying risk factors. So, and I think we shouldn't be afraid if the doctor recommends us to do these procedures. It would be for us to see if, if, if you feel perfectly well, and yet the physician recommends that, um, ask for the reason why, and if there really is a problem that's detected, then many of us are grateful that it's detected early if um, there were other things that alarm the physician to require those tests in the first place. I think Dr. Tan can confirm this is this. Doctors sometimes don't have the answer until they can eliminate factors. So they run a series of tests to minus or take off these are not the issues, etc. and then find the answers. Well, unfortunately, we don't have x-ray eyes and we also can't you know, detect um, illnesses in some of our patients. I think a lot of times when we see a patient, we try to get a full picture by simply talking. That's our first step. And then the next step is to examine the patient. But that alone naturally isn't sufficient and that's when we order tests and we try to order tests um, in sequence of relevance. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with it. I mean, recently there was an episode with my mother, for example, you know, she was having chills and shivers for maybe almost uh, over a year. And she has seen a hematologist, her blood count has always dropped even after blood uh, transfusion. She's seen her oncologist, everything, you know, they couldn't find out why until she was hospitalized and with many, many blood tests, different type of tests to eliminate whatever it is, then they realized it was pneumonia. And that has caused her over the time where she has shivers and she has chills and sometimes she's nauseous and things like that. And it was treated when she was having a hospital stay. It was only during a hospital stay they could treat it because they found out that this was that. And she was better. She was really much better for the last um, four or five months. And uh, so, so which, is, which is something, you know, I feel that uh, sometimes just seeing a doctor, like you said, order the test, so many tests, even, you know, with... with uh, um, um, uh, the spinal, uh, what do you call that? Um, lumbar puncture. puncture. N nothing was detected, but when she was hospitalized, they found out it was pneumonia. And something, you know, you would have thought that it was something easy to detect, but it wasn't. So we need to work with the doctors. Like, doctors, what is, what is considered a good patient? A good patient has come to you um, and help you to find uh, the reason why they are sick. What would make a good patient in that sense? I don't think any patient comes to us typically trying to be difficult or mm -hmm. bad. Um, at the end of the day, I think what is more important is just developing a good relationship between the doctor and the patient. I don't think there's one, one size. But it's important, for example, a patient to come, um, explain the symptoms chronologically, even if you have a time. It's like if I have a fever, when, you know, I have fever three days ago, two days ago, every other day I have, you know, you know, recording down their vital, like, you know, BP, their sugar level. It would be very helpful that. if the patients are aware of what's happening to them, able to keep a chronological order of things. And it's also the doctor's job to try and tease that out of them. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, a lot of time when you see, I mean, these days in, in, in the um, public hospital, they spend more time with the patients per se to, to ask. But, you know, with in and out, it, how much would you be able to detect? But to help the doctor, then, you know, a good record to share would be important, isn't it? Of course, of course. Okay. Everybody's asking about sugar. 
Is sugar really that bad? I debunked the myth earlier as yes. well. Yeah, so the, question, still asking the question, question is, is it true that cutting sugar intake will help with the initial stage of cancer? So if you're first diagnosed with cancer, the most important part will be making sure your diet is adequately balanced and your body is ready for the treatment to come. So cutting out foods and refined sugars like our soft drinks, candies and so uh, is, is naturally in a healthy balanced diet, it does not belong there. So sugar per se, in that form, I would say limit as much as possible. But other forms, like our, in, uh, when it comes to the form of our whole grains, our, our vegetables and our fruits as well, so that is more a healthy form of sugar. Okay, thank you. Eric, back to you, okay? A good TCM, a certified TCM, a reliable TCM, can this TCM actually cure um, you know, cancer without chemotherapy or Western treatment? Actually, for those uh, with a tu tumour or something like that, mm -hmm. we will still encourage them to uh, get it removed. Then after that is the decision whether uh, they want, uh, whether the doctors want them to discuss with the doctor and they get uh, at the discussion with the physician whether they accept this. And There are also cases where like uh, those uh, end-stage uh, uh, cancer, mm, final stage, uh, final stage patient, and uh, they 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 want they they want the one they cannot receive any. Uh, there's no no sign of improvement after seeking any uh, Western, treatment. Western treatment. Yeah, so uh, they will turn to TCM. Also, there are also cases of uh, fully suddenly recovered after that. Also, there are, there are also rare cases of that. So uh, it it really depends on the. But if you were saying if you are saying that uh, it's a if a tumour is there, you're carrying on with it and you want to just uh, seek TCM treatment, that is, uh, is, is very slow and we cannot say that it will not spread to the rest of the body. And, uh, the, it, 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 we can confirm cure. You get a combination and it's pretty complex situation, isn't it? It's not okay. singular, yeah. like you come and treat, you finish, that's all. It's not right. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of factors that surround yeah, it, isn't it? Like I say, uh, <clears throat> a lot of times we encourage them to uh, to be happy, to stay uh, emotionally positive. Okay, thank you. Ah, this is a very interesting question. Health screening, APF is eight. Does this show as a sign of liver cancer, Dr. Tan? Yeah, I think the question probably is if AFP, which is alpha AFP, fetoprotein, yes. a tumour marker, whether yeah. it suggests liver cancer. AFP in itself um, is a blood test and that alone is not diagnostic of liver cancer. Mm. Yeah, and actually to be very honest, commonly just screening for liver tumour markers, um, it's not quite standard. Mm. But if there's an abnormality that in the end is detected, then the mm. suggestion would be to have further evaluation for that. We cannot diagnose based on the tumour marker. I see. So they, you, after even seeing that you know, in the blood, you have to do other tests to confirm that. Maybe a CT, MRI, things like that. So to diagnose liver cancers, interestingly, most solid tumour cancers actually require a biopsy, which is taking mm. a sample of the tumour and look under the microscope slide. For liver cancer, interestingly, um, if we do specific scans and they have classic features of liver cancer, mm. we can sometimes make the diagnosis based on just scans alone. So that's the special thing about liver cancer diagnosis. I see. What would, um, how do they find a liver transplant or liver donor? I know like for heart, it looks at the size and, 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 and things like that, you know. For liver donor, um, how do they find a liver donor? Actually, it's a very complex um, process. Yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, first of all, what is the, the need for a liver transplant? And then who is going to be the donor? So I think in Singapore, we've got um, the system where we have um, deceased donors and we also have living donors and, and the entire process is relatively yeah, complex. So uh, there's, um, the general health of the donor that also needs to be considered and then matching of um, the liver. But it doesn't have to be family. It doesn't have to be family. Liver is one of those that doesn't have to be family. Heart doesn't have to be family. That's right. Okay. Um, last question. Actually, I know the answer. <laughs> Chemo effective for stage 4 liver cancer patient who is 82 years old, you know. Um, should just forget about treatment since it's not showing any signs and symptoms at all. Or, you know, should they do that? This is a difficult question to answer just off the cuff. I think at the end of the day, uh, while we do look at age in some of our patients, but I think nowadays, um, age is a number. What's more important is physiologically, um, how is the patient's health and 
what the other medical problems are. And it has to be a holistic assessment of every patient. Yeah. And not just look at old age and say, hey, no. Yeah. It also depends, like some 82 looks like 62, live like the 52, <laughs> and you know, um, and they have good quality of life, they're not showing any symptoms, you know. So it, it, it's probably better to have good quality of life versus seeking treatment, and then you know, there will be a slew of other issues. I think in the end, um, uh, informed decision, uh, informed discussion needs to be had first, it needs to be had first to see what the patient's condition is and what treatment can offer and what um, we, we know uh, could potentially happen without treatment. Okay. Only then we can make a decision. The in question now, should liver cancer patients go for COVID-19 vaccination? So the current MOH guidelines um, is that uh, if you're on active chemotherapy, then no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think because all this is all very new and there's a lot of research, a lot of discussions ongoing, mm -hmm. um, the recommendations may change over time as we learn more about the vaccines and including how the vaccines work in our patients with cancer and receiving chemotherapy. Yeah, sometimes you know, even the questionnaire is very straightforward. If you're receiving this, and the answer is yes, then the answer come back is no, please don't take the vaccine, you know. Mm -hmm. Even if the doctor says it's okay. So this is maybe next time or, or further down the road, you know, after they have seek treatment when there's a pause or a drug holiday, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So as Dr. Tan has said, it's all very different. Well, we have come to a very active discussion and I hope everybody have uh, learned lots, you know, in terms of superfood, all types of food, you know, debunking all the food myths, you know, and we still see a lot of questions about alcohol, um, uh, oxygenated drinks, organic food, etc, etc. I think Rachel has done a great job, you know, letting us um, know, you know, yes, no, these foods are okay to eat, you know, everything is in good proportion, moderation. Thank you very much. And then uh, thank you, Rachel, from um, the Ferry Park Hospital, our senior dietitian from Ferry Park Hospital. And then thank you, uh, Eric Tan from uh, Yuan Sang. And thank you, Dr. Tan uh, from the uh, NCIS. Uh, with this, uh, we will end tonight's session. And after this, you will see a QR code. Please scan, give us your feedback. Your feedback is very important to us. Only with your feedback, we can do better. This virtual event is organized by the Singapore Cancer Society, supported by the National University Cancer Institute of Singapore, Yu Yan Sang, and Ferry Park Hospital. Thank you everyone for participating in 2021 World Health Webinar. And uh, we are coming to an end. We wish you well, wish you healthy, and good night, everyone. Goodbye.